over the years, me and you have logged heads a few times about a few things, and then today you one ated nearly everything <laughs> we thought about over the last few years. What's going on? And like, this is a dramatic shift going to like account focused, the yeah. whole thing. Yeah. Um, honestly, I, th I mean, it's, it's what I laid out on the panel today. It's a mix of, we said it's the technology, but we made the technology get there. It really is letting go of old stubbornness. Yeah. You know, it's something we've been talking about, I think, since midway through Shadowlands, certainly not before Shadowlands, but midway through onwards. Um, a mix of seeing reception to Shadowlands, a mix of also seeing how the modern player base played classic mm -hmm. over the course of like 2019, 2020, that made us kind of just rethink all these assumptions about how WoW should be and what was integral to WoW versus what needed to evolve, what needed to adapt to the way players were looking to game in the modern age. And so I think, you know, for a long time, a lot of these character investment philosophies were the byproducts, were, were handed down from my, my forebears, from the people yeah. who trained me, from yeah, the original the leaves. Time, exactly. Like, we came yeah. into a lot of rules that were established. Yeah. And it was like, your job as game director, Ian, is to safeguard this tradition, do it well. And so taking a step back and being like, well, no, what if the tradition's wrong now? What if the tradition was right tw 20 years ago but needs to change today? That can be a, a, a hard conclusion to come to, mm -hmm. but we're certainly there now. What was the first domino to fall? I'm really curious, because today a lot fell. Yeah. It was like, okay, we're getting rid of not only the account, uh, we're, we're going more account focused instead of the cards focused, but we're also dropping like taxing you on moving resources, mm -hmm. around. like all these very established things are happening. And it, it felt like, one thing fell, it's like, let's look at everything here. This no longer yeah. makes sense. This no longer makes sense. Uh, yeah. And it doesn't fit together. So was it a case of that? Yeah, I think it was, ultimately. It was, it was asking the question of, are these principles actually making our players happier? Mm -hmm. are they, who are they serving? Are, if we are honoring some vision, some set of values that we hold dear as developers, but it's alienating our players, who is that good for? Yeah. So it's not us, and it's certainly not them. And so I think looking at the data, hearing the feedback from not just our community, but also ourselves, members of the team who all play alts as well, that, you know, the focus really, I think quality time is something that is a through line through all of this. We're trying to respect players' time, but doing that is not just, you know, about what we do in an individual character. It's about making, you sh making sure that as much of the time that you choose to spend in our world feels like high value to you yeah. and not busy work, not wasting the time so that you can get to the stuff that you enjoy in the hours that you have left. And so it's that, you know, the product of that set of um, realizations, I think probably led us, started us serious, seriously down this path two and a half years ago. But then we ran into, as I mentioned, you know, a bunch of technical challenges yep. where it's like, okay, we can, you, we, you, you, you could see the piecemeal movement in these directions of more things, you know, unlocking on vendors and being mailable to alts and so forth. But the actual solution required, you know, expansion level work to deliver. I don't think it's something that's appreciated enough, right? Because we talked about it with the bag space of like the actual original backpack. Because like legacy reputations, like you said mm -hmm. today, yeah, we're going there. It's going to be retroactive though. We're going to have to like yeah. go backwards and backwards and backwards. And I'm sure there's some people who's like, can't you just copy the number <laughs> out of one character and yeah. call it GG? But no, this is a, it's kind of a big effort, I assume, because you obviously would like to do it very quickly, but. Yeah, exactly. Right, I mean, and, and it's, not, it's not, obviously the number is not the problem, it's all the other places that reference the number. All the parts of our quest system, our you know, player condition system, vendors, et cetera, that are, where are they looking and what's the source of truth for this? This, there are also, you know, in the case of, of account-wide reputation, there are design challenges to work through and things to come up with. We need to make sure that, you know, we're changing our sources of reputation to also largely exist at a warband level. Mm -hmm. If now the right way to max a renown becomes, we'll just do the exact same things on six different characters yeah, yeah, and because yeah, it's keeps all going the same top. bucket. Well, yeah. A, now that's unbalanced, and B, that's actually like not fun either. Um, the point shouldn't be repeat the exact same activity in multiple characters for more rewards. And so, again, all of that needs to change as well, right? We need to rethink a lot of how we build the content to just be framed in an account level sense to look at the player behind the keyboard rather than the character that they're playing. Oh, that's superb. Um, I wanted to, I wanted to come at you with the, a lot of feedback I've seen from my audience, which is a lot of people who would like, they call it the WoW Exodus and all those kind of people who are very burned with Blizzard, but do want to come back, but yeah. also of like, untrustworthy and they're, they're skeptics yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Um, and the cadence we saw from an interview with Maria earlier is that the cadence is looking like one and a half years per expansion, uh, some, like slightly surly, but it's like a rough-ish. Ish. Yeah, yeah I, I think, I mean, it really it's, I think 
the key key points there. Mm -hmm. um, I think the most important thing, or like the content train has no breaks, is the goal here, yep. right? We don't want we don't want to have any long pauses, any long lulls where there's nothing new going on in WoW yeah. ever again. And now those updates come in different shapes and sizes. There's expansions, there's big, you know, dot zero patches, then there's some of the smaller patches that we've rolled out over Dragonflight. I think we're really happy with how that mix has worked out over the last year. It was rapid. I think, Dragonflight. Yeah. And I think our and it's gonna continue. And that, that's what we're signing up for. That's what the future is. That's not you know expansion specific. That is what the whole World Soul saga aims to deliver. I think something that I am think, as a point of personal pride and, and learnings um, as, a, as a developer, like when I was game, I first became game director on WoW. Mm -hmm. um, it was during the Legion expansion, right as right before Legion came out. And one of the things that I, you know, I will admit, I personally pushed pretty hard for was much a much more rapid, aggressive, robust patch plan yep. than we had seen in any of our previous expansions. Because I thought it was this is this will be amazing for players. Yeah. And if I may flatter myself, I think it was, but it came at the expense of Battle for Azeroth development. It came at the expense of just getting the next expansion done, but well, also resources polished. are finite, right? Like exactly. Resources, resources are finite. Yeah. And so I think, and then we backed away from that for a while. We're like, oh, well, that clearly was, you know, it's not worth sinking the next expansion in some ways to do this. But I think over the both, you know, learning from experience, but also growing the team and investing in the team and doing things like our acquisition of Proletariat last year to kind of continue to marshal the resources that we need have gotten us to a point now where I think we can pull this off, where yeah. we can deliver the patch content that we did during Dragonflight and still be set for something as ambitious as the World Soul Saga, as War Within, as the next step. Um, now, in terms of the content, uh, the cadence within the saga itself, I think our goal is, as Chris said, faster than it has been. Certainly yeah. faster than the two plus years where you know, it'll take until the end of the decade to finish the story. That's not what anyone is signing up for. But beyond that, I think we're going to you know, be guided by our community, make sure that you know, we also give the content time to breathe. And that if we're going to a new zone, we're going to a new raid, we're not rushing you through it just to get to the next step of the story. We want to still make sure that all of it feels rich and deep and that we're earning every step of that journey. Um, one final note, just I guess to, I've seen questions raised on the internet and elsewhere. Like, yeah, the skeptics are on the force at is, the moment, yeah. Oh, is this, is this like shrinkflation? Like, like yes. how you, know, you get fewer chips in your bag of chips? Yeah, you're just trying to push it out to sell an expansion six uh, months quicker. Exactly. Yeah. Like, no, these are expansions, right? Exactly. War, War Within has four zones and eight dungeons and a raid and new levels. And we're not going to talk much in detail, but Midnight, I can say, we'll have four zones mm -hmm. and dungeons and a raid. Like, these are expansions as you've come to know them. And we're just going to, you know, not have gaps. And we're going to be ambitious and purposeful as we, unroll this, as we unfold the story. Yeah, I think it's such a big move. Um, from what we've seen in the past where expansions have been all self-contained, one and done sort of scenarios. Yeah. Uh, how has it been internally with the, like seemingly now a seven-year-ish plan that has a, a very clear and distinct actually beginning, middle and end mm -hmm. with War Within and the Nightmare and then The Last Titan. Has that been really comfortable to work with? Like, okay, we have a beginning and we have an end and it's not a case of sitting around a table every year and going, Okay, are we going to the Dragon Isles next time? Or are we going to space? Yeah. Uh, what are we doing? Uh, it's partly comfortable, partly terrifying. Right? I mean, certainly, certainly pulling back the curtain, like, because we're also, we're making a commitment. Yes. We are, um, you know, and there's aspects of this that now we, we, we can't change. We're going to have to work around. If we come up with, if we realize there are some challenges with the ideas we have, if we get feedback, if we get new ideas along the way, we're going to have to fit that to the structure that we've laid out. At the same time, yes, yeah, certainly, you know, knowing for sure this is where we're going, this is where we're going to be, aids us in both planning for the future, but I think building richer worlds and stories today because we can foreshadow, we can plant the little seeds for things that we know will make sense, as opposed to at times in the past, frankly, doing what seemed cool at the moment and then Okay, asking ourselves, well, what do we do next? It's and then a, trying a to piece the... YouTube shots is yeah. what it feels like. It's yeah. like, yeah, this exactly. is a really cool cutscene, but then you know we talked about the world not reflecting it and where's yeah. it going. But now you know, well, it will reflect because we're yeah. already building the next world. And it, it's uh, I have two two things on this. Uh, one is the technical side. Is uh, when we last spoke, we talked about the issues of we came up with a feature, the community really liked it, but it didn't show the cracks and the crumbles until the late expansion. Mm -hmm. And obviously with the, the development cycle that you had internally is like the next thing that was already built yeah. off that is already steamrolling. So has 
there been, considering you're creating a lot of evergreen content now, has there been any changes internally in the structure that allows for a much more flexible ad adaptivity to like, oh, Delves, we could talk about yeah, Delves. Like sure. Delves started off, people loved them, they were great, they were getting sure. heroic gear from solo play. Towards the end of the expansion though, they really started to show some issues that people were having with them and et cetera, et cetera. But we've already, on, we've already built the next 12 yeah. Delves. Um, that, that's absolutely a risk. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that remains a risk in any, in any live service world. We need to be, no matter how nimble we, we get, at some point we still need to plan ahead and commit and start working on something before we know for sure where you know, the winds are blowing in the present. Um, what we can do to insulate against that is just share our plans as transparently as possible, get things out on alpha and beta for testing as early as possible, and I think make sure we're aware of past pitfalls that have only shown up later on, yeah. and do what we can to surface them early, to you know, really ask questions and try to focus testing on repeating the same pieces of content on, over and over, understanding where are the breaking points here? At what point you know, will the shelf life of this content have, have you know, been, been exceeded? And at what point do we need to move on so that we're not caught by surprise? And we yeah. can make changes early and plan around them down the line. But it's, a, it's more of an art than a science. Right? Yeah, for and, sure. Yeah. Uh, um, on the delves, though, just quickly, are they uh, dynamic in any way? Um, it's like the Skittering Breach. If I do Skittering Breach week one, is it the same one the next week? So I think the goal, so, um, the goal is, for the places to feel relatively consistent, these aren't like these aren't randomly generated yeah, yeah, yeah. Diablo style maps stuff. or whatever. Yeah. But um, in terms of the spawning there, these sorts of events that you might run into, those should vary. There will be a, a pool of available options that we'll cycle through over the course of the weeks. So again, we're like trying to think through what's this going to look like between twelve different delves, different enemies that you can encounter in each, different events that you can encounter in each. Um, there should be enough permutations there. We hope anyway to keep the experience feeling fresh for quite some time. Oh, superb, that's really good. Um, this looked to me, when Chris was explaining what uh, the saga is, like a shift to a much more narrative-driven Warcraft than maybe we've seen in the past. There's always a narrative. Yeah. Like I said, it's mostly cutscene contained, you know, then there's a break and we sort of get it piecemeal and things like that. And now you're making a, at least a six year long narrative that's coming out. So have you had to change the team internally to get more like actual story writers in or anything like that? Or is this something you've like given to the team to play with and say, go, go have fun? Yeah, I think we haven't, we haven't changed the team composition for this other than obviously Chris coming back. Yeah, yeah. Um, but no, I think the narrative team, the narrative team that we have has really embraced this and, and run with it. And I think as, as you alluded to earlier, it's exciting to know more about where we're going down the line. Having that information empowers everybody. It's mm -hmm. something that, you know, when we were focused so much on the short term very often, could be frustrating for everyone from artists to encounter designers to quest designers where they're like, hey, what do we know about this place? What do we know about this culture? Because it'll help me with my creative work. And often the answer would be, well, we're still figuring that out. We don't exactly know yet. Come back a bit later. But they have to start doing something. Yeah. Whereas now, you know, we know exactly where we're going to be adventuring in two years. Um, let's think about who the prominent characters are going to be at, at that point in are time. Are going to see some new faces? Obviously, the cutscene mm -hmm. is under and yeah. Taryn did, that team did, I'm sure when you saw that, you were like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, our, our creative <laughs> okay. cinematics team are... are yeah, yeah, I was talking to Taryn before, he was like, I was crying every time I was making it, I was like, oh my God, it's so <laughs> good. Um, but now you've got this opportunity where it's not feeling rushed, is what I'm yeah. hoping for. This is my yeah. personal hope, is like, I love lo video game stories, because you can play through them, mm -hmm. you feel connected. Mm -hmm. Are we going to see... This is, feels weird. I'm asking story-driven questions to you. <laughs> it's always mechanics-focused, yeah. but are we going to see some new faces come in? Yes. Uh, okay. That's what I'd set the... Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Right. And, and, I think, and, and I think we can do that more purposefully. Um, mm. It's a mix of, obviously, familiar faces, Thrall, Anduin, you know, Jaina, etc. Also, taking some existing characters that have not necessarily been in the spotlight and recognizing they're going to have important parts to play in and, what is yeah. to come. Right? I mean... Dr. Valeria, certainly, you know. Tyrion, with his history with the light, is going to be a factor in any coming war between the light and the void. There are others who have their stories. How do we begin to reintroduce them to players? How can, knowing if someone, if we know someone is going to be central to 12 at this yeah. point, to midnight, how can we make sure that when that arrives, everyone knows who they are and they're not being introduced for the very first time? But then also, we can think about characters we want to have central roles in 12 or 13, who are being introduced for the very first time, who we're going to meet for the very first time in our journeys in the war within, and not have that just be happenstance, 
but but much more purposeful than ever before. That excites me more than anything, genuinely. Like I know we, we always yeah. focus on mechanics and stuff, but God, I wish I could care about some of these characters. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's such yeah. a, a big a, a big part of the gaming is like, can I, I want to care if this person turns up. I want to care if that person goes. Uh, this is a skeptic question because obviously it's caused quite an uproar. Is this the first time you've, uh, with the pre-order, you can play a little bit earlier? Yeah. Uh, how did we get to that decision? Because obviously yeah. people hate feeling like they're behind. Un understood. So I, I think we want to be very mindful. I mean, we're looking at, you know, what Diablo has done, what other games have done. Mm -hmm. um, you know, at the end of the day, we're also trying to offer the maximum value in the package and the pre and the pre-purchase, but also just in the in the base expansion package. Um, price is unchanged. The base level package now includes a boost, so I think it's a better value across the board than Dragonflight was. With early access, we're definitely sensitive to any fairness issues or perceptions yeah, yeah. there. But I think the key here is that, um, as everyone who you know, certainly European players know, um, until that first weekly reset, Mythic Zero is not available. We, anything weekly is not available. Wrap requests, profession cooldowns. We're going to make sure, you know, also look at things like rare drop tables. The point here is just a little bit of a head start on leveling. Maybe, you know, if you feel like you don't have as much spare time to get to max level so that when your friends start running Mythic Zeros who were able to take time off for the expansion, you, you're behind them. Let everybody kind of get a little head start there. But the actual even pre-end game stuff is going to be inaccessible until the first weekly reset, which will be after the full global launch has occurred. And really, the intent is that by two weeks in, certainly by the time the season starts, yep. there should be no perceptible difference, no, no advantage between someone who had the early access versus someone who didn't. Yeah, so are we expecting to see, um, like we saw with Dragonflight, rare mobs, uh, the rares yeah, that they, popping up, where it's such an enormous that, exactly. part of the game. That's, that's, that's something we've been talking about. Because yeah, yeah. um, I think you know, in, in the fine print on the pre-order, page it focuses on you know mythic dungeon yeah, and weekly mythic plus and rares, weeklies, yeah. rares are an obvious one right it's like i think why well, i would say right now those all the high-end epics and those loot tables should be conditioned not to drop until the first reset super so that, I think no, that's right, the message like, that, there, and that's yeah. that's the sort of philosophically that's the sort of stuff we're aiming at here mm -hmm. this is really just about you know getting a head start on leveling not a head start on the competitive aspects of gearing in the end game okay um i guess my last question because they give me the signal um <laughs> Chris's phrase, and I, I assume he talks about this too, was it's time to come home. Which, I mean, obviously from my perspective, was like reaching out to me and the people of, who've, who've stepped away for a while. Although I still play a lot, yeah. but uh, certainly my audience does not. Uh, is that something we thought about in Tilly? Because like Dragonflight was like the transition period. You moved to the more seasonal play, and yeah. I'm, I'm interested to see... Uh, I, in fact, I'm going to use this as my last question. You moved to seasonal play more in Dragonflight, and that is now quite openly what you discuss. Mm -hmm. How has been the reception been internally to like this freedom and relaxation that we talked about last time yeah. of like, yeah, people are going to drift away for a little bit towards the end of the patch cycle. That's okay, because yeah. it doesn't mean we need to come up with a billion chores for them to do to make yeah. them play every there's, year. There, there's, I mean, there, there have been so many amazing games released this year. Right? We'd be doing our players a disservice if we tried to say, no, you have to play WoW all the time, yeah. or you're going to fall behind and not, it's not going to be relevant, and therefore you have to ignore all these other th amazing things that are happening in the industry or elsewhere. You know, I think we want to understand and build a healthy, long-term relationship with our players that is, like you said, about respect. Yes. And hopefully, you know, a lot of what we've been doing is trying to re-earn trust, knowing that it needs to be re-earned. Um, Dragonflight was, I think, a breath of fresh air in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. You know, when we say it's time to come home, there's, it's also, there's a new beginning, right? And it's a chance to get in on the ground floor of something that's going to be an amazing journey that starts here. Okay, well, I'm coming home, so that's well, okay. Love to hear. <laughs> All right, let's wrap it there.